Welcome to another Mattermost Dev Talk. My name is Jonathan Fritz and I'm a core committer over at Mattermost. Like many open source projects, we use Git as our SCM of choice, but in previous jobs, I was used to working more with Perforce and SVN. So when I joined the team, they banded together to put together this list of tips and tricks that would help me get up to speed. In this video, I hope to share some of those with you. If you're at all familiar with Git, you'll know that there are a handful of common commands that you use pretty much every time that you interact with a repository. These commands have relatively long names that take precious keystrokes to type in full. You can gain a buff to your speed by modifying your git config file to alias the longer commands with the shorter variants. In this example, we've aliased the checkout and status commands to co and s respectively, shaving precious seconds off of every interaction with git that can be better used to write awesome code. Saving keystrokes is great, but do you know what's even better? Making the git commit log just a little bit more readable with some indentation and color coding. More importantly, this example demonstrates that complicated compound commands can be aliased to short, easy to remember commands that will make your interactions with Git that much more user friendly. While we're creating aliases, this one's particularly helpful if you're the type of person that reviews a lot of pull requests. At Mattermost, every character of code that goes into our master repository has to be reviewed by at least two core committers, so we spend an awful lot of time reading and testing other people's code. This alias lets you refer to a pull request by the number that's assigned to it by GitHub and check it out into your local dev environment for testing. It's great for cases in which you're not 100% sure how a pull request works or what other parts of the code it might impact just from giving it a read. No matter how good your team is, every piece of software has bugs, and tracking them down in a busy repository that accepts a whole bunch of pull requests every single day can be difficult. Git Bisect makes this easier. It lets you define a commit that is known to be bad, and an earlier commit that's known to be good, and it uses a binary search to intelligently select commits within the established range for you to test. Each time it checks out a commit, you test it to see if the bug that you're working on is present, and then mark that commit as either good or bad. Git Bisect will use your feedback to continue the search in the appropriate direction, vastly narrowing down the number of commits that you need to manually test. So to demonstrate how Git Bisect works, I've got a really simple sample project here. We can take a look at the log and see that there's been a handful of commits and that one of those commits here introduced a bug um, and then that bug was subsequently fixed. Now say for example that I hadn't actually fixed the bug and I wanted to figure out where it was introduced. I could do that really easily by going git bisect start and then we can say git bisect bad and we can tell it that this commit here was bad and then we can say git bisect good and tell it that we knew that this commit here was good. And then what it's going to do is pick a commit somewhere in the middle and tell us, hey, uh, test that commit and tell me if it's still actually good or bad. So then we can go run hello world and we can say, see that the output is hello words, which is not what we expect. So that's bad. So we can go git bisect bad to mark this commit as bad, and then it will jump down to another commit that's between the one that we marked as bad and the one that we marked as good to start, and say, hey, test this commit here. So we can do our test again, and say, oh, hey, that commit was good. There's no problem there. So we go git bisect good to mark that one as good, and then it tells us, rightly so, that commit 55303 was the commit that introduced the bug. And what it's done here is basically just taken our list of commits and done a binary search. It's taken the two boundaries that we said, one was good, one was bad, looked in the middle, said, hey, was that one good or bad? And we told it which it was, and then it's looked in the other direction, and by process of elimination, it's told us that can only be one possible commit that actually introduced the bug. So now we know where it was introduced, and we can go and fix it. Now, as useful as Git Bisect is, programmers tend to be a lazy bunch and generally prefer to automate boring tasks like manual testing for the presence of a bug. Git Bisect Run automates the manual bisect process, executing the specified command on each of the commits that it checks out. This works with any command that exits with a return code of zero on success and a non-zero return code on error. It works particularly well with unit tests that pass if the bug doesn't exist and fail when it does, but it can also be used to find the commit that introduced a dependency or a line of code into the repository. Patch mode is another convenience feature that's built right into Git. It starts with an interactive prompt that lets you choose chunks of code to act on. For example, if you're trying to fix a bug and you end up refactoring something in the process, you might want to split the refactor out into one commit and save the bug fix for another future commit. 
Running git add with the dash lowercase p flag will open up an interactive prompt that lets you choose which chunks of code to stage, allowing you to commit some changes from one file while keeping others from the same file in your local environment to be included in future commit. Patch mode also works with other git commands like reset and checkout, allowing you to revert some changes but not others instead of blindly throwing away all the changes that you made to an entire file. Okay, to demonstrate the patch flag, um, I've got a sample file here. I've made two changes in this file. I've changed the name of this struct here from service settings to service configuration. And I've changed the name of all of these set defaults functions over to set default values. And what I'd like to do is just commit the struct rename. I don't actually want to commit the uh, function rename yet. I'd like to split those two things into separate commits. So this is a good case where we can use the patch command. So if I go ahead and go git add, because I'd like to add this file to my staged commit, and I specify the dash lowercase p command, git's going to present me with this interactive prompt that allows me to choose which parts of the file I want to stage. So the first part of the file that it's looking at is that struct rename. And I would like to take this. And then the second part of the file that it's presenting me with is this function rename. Notice here that this line includes both a struct rename in the receiver and also a function rename. I only want part of this, so I'm going to use E for edit, and this is going to let me edit the patch for this specific line. And so I can undo the function rename, but leave the receiver rename. And then it's going to ask me if I want to take this function rename, and I'm going to say no, and then no. And then I know that the rest of the file is just function renames and that all the other interesting stuff is done, so I can actually skip pressing no a whole bunch of times by pressing D. And what D does is it tells Git that there's nothing else in the file that I want to take. And now we're finished. If I look at my status, I'll see that I've got config.go staged, but I've also got it down here in the not staged. And if I diff just the staged files, we can see that just the two changes that I asked for, this struct rename and the impact of the struct rename, have actually been staged for commit. And if we diff the rest of the file that's not staged, we can see that it contains all of the function renames. So now I can effectively break those changes out into two separate commits. Now while we're working on making our lives easier, let's talk for a minute about Git hooks. They're sort of like plugins, customizable scripts that can be written in your language of choice and execute before or after different Git actions, changing the way that Git works. At Mattermost, we enforce a style guide across all of our code, and many developers use a pre-commit hook to execute the style checker before committing their code. Once it's set up, the style check will run every time you try to commit, and the commit will fail if your changes don't conform to our style guide. Another way to extend Git is to integrate it with third-party utilities. One project that I really like is Diff So Fancy, an open source project that provides a cleaner, easier to read Diff viewer for Git. After installing it, you just update your Git config to set Diff So Fancy as the default pager, and Git will pipe the output of commands like Diff and log through it before passing them on to Less. If you wish, you can even install an interactive application called TIG that replaces the Git command line entirely. The bottom line here is that Git is incredibly customizable and can be adapted to suit your workflow, whatever that may be. Now it's been said that you can spend your entire career using Git and still not understand everything that there is to know about it. That may well be true, but for something that's so complicated, Git is also incredibly elegant and easy to use. I hope that the tricks that I've shared with you in this video have given you some ideas for how to up your Git game, and that you'll consider using your newfound skills to contribute to the Mattermost project. If you want to get involved, you can check us out in GitHub, or join our pre-release server to see what we're all about. Thanks for watching. Cheers.